take the stand from Sanford. One of them, Detective Serino, he initially uh, questioned George Zimmerman right after the event happened. And he, his, for, his inclination was to bring manslaughter charges against George Zimmerman. Do we have that tape from the interrogation? Do we have that tape available of Detective Serena? We, we'll have it soon now. As soon as we get it, we'll, we'll let you listen. But let's talk a little bit about that because there's some controversy surrounding this detective. He's, been, he's since been demoted, and nobody can exactly figure out why, Jason. Well, you know, there, there are so many political machinations that are going on the moment this case started because you had, he was basically overruled. More people thought that this was self-defense. He was the one who thought it was manslaughter. Uh, and, and so a lot of other people got involved. But I, I think... He's a police officer, and, and that's not going to matter. Anyone who was a member of the law is going to be somebody that this jury will listen to, so that's why the prosecution wants him. And, and I'm going to play a bit of that interrogation. This is the initial interrogation between the detective and George Zimmerman. George Zimmerman was being questioned about the events of that night. Let's listen to, to a piece of that interrogation. What happened this evening is that you essentially saw somebody who you in good faith thought was doing something wrong. And you ever hear Murphy's Law? Okay, that's what happened. This person was not doing anything bad. Um, you know the name of the person that died? Trayvon. Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Benjamin Martin. He was born in 1995, February the 5th. He was 17 years old. An athlete, um, probably somewhere, somewhere's going to be in the aeronautics. Um, a kid with the future. A kid with folks that care. In his possession, we found a uh, can of uh, iced tea and uh, bag of skills and about four dollars in cash not the gun okay so after this interrogation as i said detective sereno decided that george zimmerman probably should be charged with manslaughter and page pate brought up an interesting um an interesting thing he told me earlier this morning page you said it doesn't much matter who was on top or who was on bottom during that tussle what does matter? Well, at the end of the day, the judge is going to instruct the jury on the law relating to self-defense. And what's really important is that George Zimmerman had to have been acting lawfully at the time he used lawful or deadly force against Trayvon Martin. So if he initiated the fight, if he's in there throwing punches, just because Trayvon throws a few himself and may even be winning at some point does not give Zimmerman the right to take out a gun and shoot him. Because Zimmerman, if he's initiating the fight, if he's in there grappling with him, then he's not acting lawfully at the time. Is it enough, you know, that George Zimmerman may have been following Trayvon Martin? Is that enough to be the aggressor? I don't think so. I mean, we heard that Zimmerman was asked, you know, you don't need to do that. You don't need to follow him. Uh, he wasn't instructed to do that. But I think he had a lawful purpose for being there at the time. I mean, that is part of his deal as the neighborhood watch. But once you start throwing blows, once you start a physical altercation, then it's assault and battery, and you're not acting lawfully at the time. But how how can you possibly figure out who threw the first punch? Well, that's where Rachel Gentile comes in, because when she claims that she hears the phone drop. But I, I think the prosecution is also going to make this argument with their ballistics expert, that, and they said this in the opening statement, Zimmerman had a gun in the chamber. I mean, he, he got out of the car with the gun ready to shoot. He didn't have the safety on. And so if, if they sort of build that, he gets out of the car and he doesn't have to. He's got a bullet in the chamber. And then Gentel says, you know, I think Trayvon was hit. That can maybe establish that he was the aggressor. But that's, they're going to have to string all that together. Okay, so, so also maybe introduced later to in court when you don't really know is this reenactment video. In fact, uh, detectives brought George Zimmerman back out to the scene of the incident. And George Zimmerman went through um, exactly what happened that night. He was very animated. Do we have a bit of sound from that? Okay, let's listen. I passed here, I looked, I didn't see anything again, and I was walking back to my truck. And then when I got to right about here, he yelled from behind me to the side of me. He said, yo, you got a problem? And I turned around, and I said, no, I don't have a problem, man. Where's and he, where was he at? About? He was about there, but he was walking towards me. Here. Yes, sir. I believe, like I said, I was already past that, so I didn't see exactly where he came from, but he was about where you are. Okay. And I said, no, I don't have a problem. And I went to go grab my cell phone, but my, I left it in a different pocket. And I went, I looked down in my pant pocket, and he said, you got a problem now. And then he was here, and he punched me in the face. And you see that big Band-Aid on the back of George Zimmerman's head. Uh, Sonny, I want to ask you this question because as part of that interrogation, Detective Serino also said that he didn't think George Zimmerman was particularly afraid of Trayvon Martin that night. Yeah, that, that's really important. And, um, you know, I, I think Paige is right in the sense that 
What this case is going to boil down to is whether or not George Zimmerman was the initial aggressor. And in determining that, what the jury needs to look at is, you know, what is provocation? How do you instigate? Is following and approaching and confronting enough? I actually think that it is. If you look at Florida case law and if you look at self-defense law, um, I, I, I think, and, and you use your common sense, which the jury is going to be asked to do once they get back into the jury room, I think that will be enough. Then the analysis is going to change. The analysis becomes, okay, if you start the fight, if you are the initial aggressor, then you have to be in fear. You have to be in fear of imminent death or great bodily harm. And on top of that, you have to use and exhaust all reasonable means to get away. So if Detective Serino is saying, you know, he didn't seem that afraid of Trayvon Martin, that does take self-defense off the table. And, and I think what you have to, you have to think about it in a really common sense way, because all of this is legalese and, um, you know, lawyer speak. You know when you're a kid and you're fighting with your sister or your brother, when your parents come in, what do you say? He started it. <laughs> she started it. Well, that's what the common law is about. It's about who started it. And when you start a fight and you're losing, you then can't pull out a gun and kill someone unless the tables have really, really turned. And that's why I think Detective Serino's um, testimony, or rather that tape, may be important to the prosecution because it comes down to that important, important issue. Who started it? Did he start it or did Trayvon Martin start it? All right, uh, Sonny Hostin, Paige Pate, Jason Johnson, we're gonna take another break, so stick around. We'll be right back with more from Sanford. Ready? Happy birthday.